Well, there you are. The Ice Age is in full swing, and you're huddled in your fur, facing the chill of an Arctic night. Imagine being an ancient human, a hunter-gatherer, who's just managed to snatch a giant reindeer for dinner. But wait, there's a problem. Your tummy can't possibly digest the massive amount of protein. So, what to do with all the leftover meat? Chances are that, as we're speaking, there's a little creature sniffing around at your feet, patiently waiting for you to throw a bone or even a juicy chunk of meat. I'm talking about dogs, of course. Today, it's estimated that over 60% of U.S. households own a pet, while the total number of pet dogs in the world is over 400 million. If we look throughout history, it may seem like these smart animals have been man's best friend forever. Alexander the Great, for example, had his own beloved pup named Peritas. It was such an important part of his owner's life that, after the dog passed away, Alexander named a city after it. Historians can't pinpoint the exact location of this city, but it's presumed it was somewhere in modern-day Pakistan. Napoleon himself had his own little dog. Well, it belonged to his wife, actually, and rumor has it he wasn't particularly fond of the canine. Regardless, Fortune, the pug, made it to the list of famous dogs. Then there was Barry, a courageous Saint Bernard, said to have rescued over 40 people in the Swiss mountains over a period of 12 years. There must have been a starting point to this human-canine partnership, right? And new research suggests that it might have been our early ancestors' inability to digest excessive protein that first set the stage for our long-standing relationship with man's best friend. So, you might ask, what do a pile of leftover meat and the early domestication of dogs have to do with each other? Well, the answer lies in our prehistoric past. You see, early humans, like us, had an omnivorous digestive system. Too much meat wasn't their jam. In fact, going overboard with protein could lead to dire outcomes like nasty stomach upsets. Mm -mm. This nutritional predicament could have been even more pronounced during the chilly winters of the Ice Age. Imagine the prey back then, reindeer, wild horses and such, whose bodies were nearly devoid of fat and mostly lean muscle. Humans, living in the harsh conditions of the Arctic and subarctic, relied heavily on these animals for food. However, consuming such protein-rich meat would have overloaded their digestive systems. So, what do you do when you got more meat than your belly can handle? According to researchers, the surplus would likely have been shared with wolves. This, in turn, might have sparked a unique kind of friendship between our ancestors and these wild canines. Now here's where things get really interesting. Usually wolves and humans would have been fierce rivals, battling it out for the same prey. But in the harsh winters of the Ice Age, when meat was surplus to the humans' needs, sharing wouldn't have cost the humans anything. Instead, it might have led to surprisingly peaceful coexistence ultimately leading to the taming of wolves. Over time, the wolves that took advantage of these handouts probably became friendlier toward humans. They eventually might have become the first domesticated dogs, hanging around human camps for a free meal, helping to guard against predators, and providing warmth during those cold Arctic nights. The theory isn't just a figment of scientific imagination. Evidence from early fossil records, primarily from extremely cold areas back then, supports this idea. And it's a pretty cool concept, right? Our inability to stomach a purely carnivorous diet might have been the catalyst for one of the most enduring partnerships in history. The bond between humans and dogs. This theory gives a whole new meaning to the phrase, leftovers are for the dogs. Now, since we're on the topic of dog history, Ever heard of pre-contact dogs? Now picture this, it's the 19th century, and explorers are trudging through North American terrains, meeting the local wildlife. During their travels, they stumble upon these super-tough, wolf-like dogs that belong to the Native Americans. These dogs were beefy, imposing, and instead of barking, they had this eerie habit of howling. Fast forward to today, those wolf dogs have all but disappeared. 
Also, their genetic footprint isn't found in any of the modern pooches we have today. So, why should we care about these extinct canines? Well, it seems that the DNA obtained from some of these ancient doggos could help solve the mystery of where America's first dogs came from and how they disappeared. One geneticist at the University of Kansas explains that this research supports the idea that the first humans in America didn't bring their dogs along with them. Instead, these furry friends would have arrived thousands of years later. So where does this info come from? Let me take you back to the 1960s and 70s when archaeologists were digging up two sites in western Illinois. They found evidence of ancient people who, aside from chilling by the river collecting shellfish and hunting deer, buried their dogs in little graves. And get this, carbon dating showed that these bones were roughly 10,000 years old, making these pups the oldest known dogs in America. Now the question is, where did these dogs originate? To answer that, a whole bunch of researchers from around the world compared the DNA of these ancient dogs with the DNA of 145 modern and ancient dogs. And what they found was pretty amazing. The DNA of these ancient American dogs was unique, not seen in any other canine species. This means that the wolf dogs were indeed genetically different from their European counterparts. Researchers have started to call these ancient pooches pre-contact dogs. Their closest relatives were 900-year-old dogs from an Asian island. Using the mutation rate of DNA as sort of a molecular clock, the team of researchers guessed that the two dog breeds might have shared a common ancestor almost 16,000 years ago. These geological finds suggest that the first dogs may have migrated to the Americas from Asia long after humans did. Remember the Bering Land Bridge that connected Asia to Alaska? The one that disappeared about 11,000 years ago? Well, dogs must have crossed it before it vanished. These prehistoric pups probably hung around with humans in Alaska for a while, or might have journeyed with some to the heart of North America. And once humans saw how handy these dogs were for hunting, lugging stuff around, and protecting camps, they probably brought more along for the ride. Now, let's dive a bit deeper into these pre-contact dogs' genetics. When researchers analyzed their nuclear genome, which is the DNA they get from both mommy and daddy, they discovered that these dogs were truly unique. Their closest living relatives are Arctic breeds, like Alaskan Malamutes and Huskies. It seems that these modern dogs and the pre-contact dogs might have come from the same Asian source population. But thousands of years apart, this implies that if you own an Arctic dog, you're probably having a pet with an old lineage. On the contrary, most other dogs probably came from Europe or Asia quite recently. Even ancient dogs, like this Mexican Shelowitz Quintley, which people believe have been around for ages, don't have the same genetics as these pre-contact dogs. Sure, they might look identical, but their DNA tells a totally different story. So, why didn't researchers find any genetic trace of these pre-contact dogs in today's dogs? Well, one theory is that in the 19th century, European dogs might have brought diseases that the local American dogs weren't prepared for. What's probably the most interesting aspect of these pre-contact dogs is their diet. Modern dogs don't have the proper jaw structure to be able to chew down on a bone altogether. Their teeth aren't that resistant, and their teeth are also much pointier in shape. Pre-contact dogs, on the other hand, had thick and flat teeth. They also had shorter snouts, making their bite even more powerful. This feature is what earned them the name bone crushers and why they're often compared to modern hyenas. And, apparently, chasing after tennis balls and frisbees came much, much later.